Hi Vince, thank you for joining us. You're welcome, thanks for having me. <laughs> so, you have a prolific career as a DJ and a music producer with over 200 EPs, 12 albums and 75 remixes. You've worked with outstanding names in the industry such as Laurent Garnier, Derek May, Joe Postel, and Richie Yotin, just to name a few. As a DJ, you've played iconic venues such as Enter at Space Ibiza, Bergen in Berlin, or Warm Tokyo, and many more. I'm sure we'll talk about all this interesting career, but okay. recently I'd like to start in another, in another point. Recently, you started teaching at the Conservatorium in Amsterdam. Uh, I chose to start here because this is very interesting as electronic music always struggled to be accepted by music and musicians, as well as by the wider audiences as music and culture alike. The Netherlands has been always innovative in this and having a conservatorium include electronic music within its teaching programs is a big step. Do you think this is a, a first big step that other countries should follow and why? Yeah, oh my God. So the um, the eternal battle of old versus new is it's, um, it's something that even, I mean, our school is now four years old and we help, I helped launch the school. And even in those four years, we've came across situations where the old versus new thing still exists, you know, like, for example, in the conservatorium itself, we're not in the main building with the noisy neighbors. So we get through out to a different building. Um, in the main building, uh, they're shocked and they just don't understand that they, we create music. Exactly, but it's yeah. 2021. Uh, they didn't yeah. get the, the, you know, the memo. What, what's happening here? You know, like yeah. it's um, not you. <laughs> I have to say, not all the not all the, the teachers are, have that way, but the the people who are there from for a long time, they don't understand that we create new music for them. It's just alien, you know. But. Um, I, it's kind of fun as well. We kind of play on it a little bit, but the the conservatorium, as as a rule, um, have been massively supportive of this project because they see the future, and the future isn't three hundred years ago. It's three hundred years in the future. Um, so, and all credit to them for helping us get us off the ground, and they've been really supportive. Um, in terms of other countries, I think it's inevitable, to be honest. How long it takes other countries, I'm not sure. We're really fortunate in the Netherlands that we've had massive support for the music industry right through all social sectors. Like, the radio's always supported house and techno. Um, the festivals are the biggest festivals in the world. Like, there's 300 festivals every summer. In such a small country, it's ridiculous. <laughs> But they're all fully supported, sponsored and well funded and they're some of the best organised festivals in the world. So this country's got a real base in electronic music and that has really helped cement the opportunity to make this happen. I think other countries that lack behind in terms of having a music culture that's so deep um, may take longer to get there. But it's inevitable. I mean, the world changes every day with music and... Uh, I think at some point everyone will have to do something. Yeah, well, the Netherlands has always been uh, innovative in this, but it's it's not innocent. In uh, 2012, they did a study called Dance Genomics, mm. which uh, actually uh, measured the economic impact of electronic music uh, uh, in the in, in the in the economy of the Netherlands. Mm. And back then, it was already uh, a large, well, half a billion, <laughs> uh, yeah. 587 million. Uh, uh, euros okay yeah. so uh because they also saw the contribution that uh, this culture brought to the economy i think they had you know like they 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 thought okay let's let's do it you know let's let's foster this culture yeah. let's uh, you know nurture it and and now they now the netherlands has a lot of djs on the top 10 and a lot of important festivals and uh, yeah. a fully full-fledged culture of electronic music that uh, other countries have had more trouble mimicking or at least trying to well i can speak for portugal of course <laughs> we don't have uh, electronic music in the conservatorium no way yeah. um we still we, we still have a lot of people that are you know oh but is that music you know <laughs> just out of curiosity though is does the portuguese have pop departments in the conservatorium even 
where they have like more traditional Portuguese music, or is it just yes, the, like, that's traditional Portuguese music, and there's some room for pop. Although okay. it, it, it there's room if it's made with instruments. You see. Yeah. So that it, it's it's old school versus I don't know future new school whatever. But You're trying to convince someone who's seventy five that a laptop yeah. can can be a musical instrument is sometimes a bit difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, w were you surprised that the conservatorium invited you to teach? Uh, how how that, how did that happen? Do you know it's weird because for a long time even going back to previous relationships, like a long, long time, people have always said that I should be teaching to some degree and I've never really listened to a single word of it. Um, I didn't see myself as a teacher. I, I never really felt like someone who wanted to preach or teach in that kind of environment. And then um, I got invited to do some master classes for the School of House in Amsterdam. And um, Victor Corral, the guy who was doing the, the, the organization of that at the time, um, he pulled me aside afterwards. He said, you've got a really unique way of teaching. And I think it's because you're not from the teaching establishment. You're doing it from ex pure experience. And because you're still touring, it's really interesting for us to have you here. And then the following year, after a couple more master classes, he said, I've got something exciting that I want to offer you. And we went for lunch. And he just basically said, we want to see if you'd be interested in teaching at the conservatorium for a new electronic school called AMA, which is Amsterdam Electronic Music Academy. And um, from there, we just helped get it going and get it set up. And now we're in the start of the fourth year in September, just gone. So I'm still a little bit like, uh, am I teaching? <laughs> <laughs> a little yeah. bit. <laughs> I was going to ask how mind blown you were by the, you know, by the invitation and by the, the you know, yeah. having AEMI uh, working within the conservatorium. Yeah, I think, first of all, I think I was, didn't know what to expect from the fact that the conservatorium were doing an electronic music school. I had no idea what to expect and whether this was just a gimmick that they felt they needed to explore or whether they were serious about it. And it wasn't until I met the director of the pop department, Jack uh, Pisters, who convinced me that actually this is something they've been wanting to do for a long time. They just never found the right partner yet. And um, now they had found the right partner and they were trying to gather up a, a nice group of teachers who had vast experience. And I teach with some amazing producers. Um, so I'm very, I feel very... I'm very, um, I feel like in one degree, I've kind of worked my ass off for 25 years to get something happen at a really high level. I always intended it to be gigging like 10 times a week, every weekend. I didn't quite get to that level yet. I'm still trying to with all the projects that I'm about to launch, etc. Um, and I'll never stop that. And I think that's one thing the students like to see is their teacher out gigging and being active and stuff. Um, but at the same time, um, I just feel very honoured to be part of that and also proud of it now because each teacher has their own curriculum and my curriculum across the courses that I do is mine. It belongs to me. It's not like any other DJ course or any other remix course or anything. I do it very differently and um, I think that's why the students really enjoy it because they won't get it anywhere else. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. And you teach uh, four modules within AMA. You teach DJ Advanced, the art of remixing, DJ and repertoire, and Style Labs. Yeah. Although although they are self-explanatory, can you describe each one specifically and how did you make those programs your own? Yeah, so the first year of the school, um, I didn't have a curriculum that set up, really. I had an idea what I wanted to do, but after six months, I was like, no, no, no. We have to change this. So um, Style Labs was the first class that I got introduced to. And what we do in Style Labs is essentially talk about different styles of electronic music and what the fundamental things are of these styles and what the important things are that you have to include in the music, whether it's arrangement, whether it's mixing techniques, whether it's sound sources, whether it's um, you know various different gimmicks that these styles use or tricks. So we talk about all that and then we get the students to recreate each style. Um, throughout the first year. Um, the DJ course is, is again, it's really unique, it's quite different and I sometimes have issues because some people coming into the class are very grassroots level, 
and some people are quite advanced so at some point I've got to get them to the same level when we get to the end of the year and it's a bit of a mission but it works well the way that I do it um, and I talk about obviously I talk about the DJ side, side of things so we talk about the, the equipment how to use the equipment we talk about the repertoire side of things so like what to mix when to mix how to mix it um, and choices for tracks and stuff like that so that's kind of what the DJ course is about then we go into year two and I do a couple of elective courses I do style labs as well in the second year but the two electives are the art of remixing and the advanced DJ course so advanced DJ course, we do a lot of hybrid stuff. So like we use Ableton with CDJs all synced up, which is really hard to do, but I've managed to find a way. Um, and we use lots of drum machines and uh, synths and stuff like that, all synced up with the uh, CDJs, so that's quite fun. And I kind of get them into starting to prepare for their live end event for the school. And uh, that's kind of my responsibility to get them ready for that. Um, are, you, are you bringing the old schoolers into the party? Yeah, everyone's included. So we're, a, we're a very inclusive school. <laughs> um, you can be any colour, you can be any size, you can be any age. Exactly, matter. any age is important. Yeah, any age, yeah. <laughs> um, and then the remix course is, again, I do this with another uh, teacher called Dennis, who incidentally was Tiesto's ghost producer for 10 years. But that's another subject. Um uh, and we do this remix course where um, we basically go to the bare bones of what a track really is and we look at the, the you know building things back up again and then what the things are what makes a remix a remix is it a cover version is it you know a recreation is it an, a lazy remix is it a really detailed live remix there's so many different sort of avenues you can go with it but that's basically the, the courses that I teach at the school yeah, I was going to speak about remixes because when we analyze your extensive body of work, we do understand it's clear that you love remixes. So <laughs> uh, is, is that true? And what's your personal take on remixes, how to approach a track to remix? Um, yeah, I haven't done as many remixes as some people, I think because I'm very fussy about what I do. For me, a remix, I, I, try, and, I try and bring as much to the table as I can without it being one of my own tracks. So I really work hard at it and I use every single part that the artist gives me in some creative way but keep the fundamentals the same so that people recognise it's a remix and not an original track. And for me I work really hard on them, I take quite a long time to do them um, and they're not cheap either because I put so many hours on it and I'm really proud of the remixes that I've done. Um, I think two or three of my best remixes are not out yet and I'm so, I can't, they've been delayed and delayed because of the vinyl thing and I'm like, oh my god. Oh, so, oh you have the vinyl thing too. It's it's oh, everywhere. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a disaster. Jesus, Although, a disaster. Today, <laughs> I got the vinyl of my album today, which is nice. Um, finally, on time. I can't believe it. It's actually yeah. on time. Exactly. <laughs> a bloody miracle. Um... Yeah, so I remix work, there's there's a five or six remixes in the pipeline for next year, which are already finished and stuff, so I think people will like them. I've, I've done, worked hard on them. Okay, cool. Well, this is a question I normally don't do on interviews, but I, I, I don't know why I wanted to, to do it to you, which is when you're deep in creating music, do you have musical dreams? Do you remember them and put them to use? Yeah, I can't sleep because of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, the... When you say musical dreams, do you mean like you actually... Dream, dreaming with music. Okay. I don't... I, I can't say that I dream with music, but what I do is when I'm in the studio, if I'm in the studio till three in the morning or something and I'm tired and I'll go to bed and that piece of music will just... It won't leave me alone. <laughs> and <laughs> it will stay in your head. So I, I have a slight, a slight piece of synesthesia where music is shapes to me and smells and i think sometimes that's how i'm able to create something that's really awesome to create yeah it's i can't explain it it's so hard because it doesn't it words don't if you know what i mean i can't say it in words how it feels but um i'll go to bed and if i say for example this is the best way i can describe it if i'm making a piece of music and it has three main elements, then I will be lying in bed and I will go to sleep and I will dream about three things. 
and it'll be shapes and when I get up the next day the first thing I think of is these shapes and when I come into the studio I try and recreate those shapes and sound does that make sense it does it's <laughs> funny how you make the connection with geometry you know like you dream of shapes yeah yeah. Well, maybe yeah, I've got I've, so many things that I've, releases I've done are about shapes, and uh, it's hard to explain. I'm, I'm trying my best to explain. Yeah, I'm, yeah, it, it's I'm a also, hard question. It's a hard question because I'm trying uh, not to be arty farty about it as well. I'm, try, <laughs> I'm not being hippie like I'm, I'm genuinely trying to make sense of it myself. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it's it's fun. It's it's uh, it's um, dreams sometimes can be a, a source of inspiration and and of you know problem solving and that's where I was going with this question. If you actually dreamt of music and if you, yeah. well, I won't go problem solving, but if you you know bridge some gaps while uh, dreaming, that was yeah. the idea. <laughs> okay, I think maths a lot. Mathematics plays a big part in yes and stuff for that. Yeah. Numbers and shapes really take control. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> well, smells and colors, not so much, but... <laughs> yeah, colors, I don't do colors. Colors is, no, colors is off the radar. Smells, definitely smells. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like if I've got a baseline running, I can, it smells like something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't tell too many people this because it's a bit weird. No, but, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, it's interesting. It's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I wanted to talk about uh, your label and, you know, paired with all your work as a lead lecturer, you were also keeping busy on the creative side. Your label, Every Soul, uh, recently released DNA Resequenced, uh, a remix album where you've gathered some very interesting names, <laughs> like Carl Craig. Can you plug it again while we're here? <laughs> yeah, you see. <laughs> <laughs> How did this project come about and how did you approach the remixes? Because it's such a, a set of, of important names that uh, it must have been, uh, I don't know, uh, a process. Yeah, the process was huge, actually, bigger than I anticipated. Uh, and actually, the remixes that are out is only the first part. There's another part coming next year. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, I've already got some of the remixes for the second part in. Um, so DNA was my goodbye to Detroit Techno. That was the whole point of the original album, the 18 track album, like two years ago. Because I, I got a, a little bit. It's a requiem <laughs> to Detroit Techno. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's kind of worked out a weird way. I, I, I never anticipated this would be happening. <laughs> but, um, I had just got a bit tired. I'd got tired of it all. I'd felt like, okay, how many funky jazzy 909 hi-hats can I put in a track without being bored and I'd saturated that point but I thought I want to just do something that's different and it served me well and I love it to death and I'll always cherish it but I want to just as an artist I want to move on to other things and part of the part of the process behind that was the Vince Watson stuff was going to be heading more towards the house side of things and the more musical side the jazzy side the thing because that's the stuff that people expect from me a lot i, I was going to ask if, if that is is that age related <laughs> yeah partly yeah no I, <laughs> yeah, yeah it makes sense it does yeah, of course, course. Yeah. Well, you've got the thing is you you've got to follow where your fan base is and they're at that stage where the the music's slowing down a bit and i totally understand that and it's fine i've got no issues with that but the other side of me because i'm split right down well i'm split into four parts but the techno side of things it's going to be a brand new project which launches in February um, and I wanted to put all my techno energy into that instead. So that was the plan. I thought, okay, DNA, I'll do the Detroit thing and I'll say goodbye. So the process of making this 18 track album made me realise that I can't say goodbye to it, really. Um, <laughs> but I was determined to just go for it anyway and I thought, okay, let's just say goodbye. And I put it out and it sold amazingly well. We think we pressed it three times on vinyl as well. It was like ridiculous. We even did a limited edition red vinyl version, which is quite hard to get now. And um, that told me everything really that I needed to know that I can't just walk away from something like that. People are looking for that sound again, it seems. that People are more interested in musical things again, so I'm, I would be silly to just, for the sake of it, walk away from it. And instead I just thought, well, I'll do something else if I'm inspired. You know, I'm not going to just say no for the sake. And then I thought, 
Well, actually, if I go back a little bit, the whole idea of DNA was to do the, the original album, but I also wanted to get artists from the three places that I love to take part in it, like Scotland, Detroit, and Amsterdam. Um, but I never knew if it was going to happen or not, because, you know, if the album hadn't have sold so well, I probably wouldn't have put the energy or finances into making it happen. But it did so well, and straight away I was like, okay, we're going to do this project. And... Um, then I just set about approaching people whose music I really respected. I was really fortunate to get most of the people that I wanted. Some people I was really surprised at who said no in a kind of disrespectful way. And I was, it was hero to zero with a few of them, which was really surprising and it really disappointed me. Yeah, sometimes um, it happens and it's a bummer. It does, yeah. But I, 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 I digress. I move on from that anyway. And um, so I've got some really nice, big, special artists on the next part. And now I'm not quite finished putting that one together. But yeah, the um, the, the resequence part one is out on Friday. And it, it came out last week on Bandcamp, but vinyl on worldwide on Friday. So um, the first name I asked was Carol. Um, because, well, first of all, I wanted to ask the artists based on the tracks themselves because the tracks that the track for example that carol remixed the holographic it was made with him partly in mind when i made it, it vice versa vice versa so i wanted to try and get the artist to, to reflect the inspiration that was in the track in the first place so i asked carol straight away he was like yeah love it let's do it and i was super happy about that and then steve rackman i think was the next one because he's one of my big buddies from Amsterdam. And then the rest of them were more curated a bit more um, based on the tracks and stuff. So, yeah, it's a nice balance. Some some of the mixes are different from what I expected. Some are better than I expected. It's like, it's a whole mix. But overall, I was so happy with, uh, with the selection. With the, the end result. Now, yeah. I'm interested in knowing about this musical growth of yours. Um, of course, you're not going to stop doing uh, techno. But... Um, where where does your uh, your musical path uh, where where is it taking you? Is it taking you more to the house side of things, to the jazzy side of things? What what do you where do you wish to go? Uh, I think I'm about to become a bit of a musical animal. <laughs> um, I think for the last couple of years, because I've got a five year old daughter and she's taken so much energy, and also this studio is only about a year and a half old. So for the last few years, I haven't had the time to focus on everything that I've wanted to do, and it's been a little bit frustrating. But now I've got a bit more flexibility, and I'm ready. next year is going to be a big year for me. I'm, I'm launching two new projects. And to answer your question, I'm not going in any one specific direction. I'm just doing all of them with different projects. So like the house stuff, um, I've got some nice releases lined up next year already. For house material i've got some more stuff coming in yoruba um tribe are asking for music john dixon's label wants some music um oh that's so, great yeah and i've got another one for joe Cassell's label too so the house side of things is taking care of itself and of course i've got a couple of singles on my own label that are more house based so that is that's done and i'm happy with that the techno thing that i'm launching in february is called amorphic and it's much darker, much faster, much more uh, linear, minimal approach to things. It's a bit different from like the usual suspects, and but it's going to be a completely live thing where I'm not using laptops or anything. So that's going to take care of the energy and the sort of high impact sort of stuff. Um, I'm also launching a much awaited electronica project, which is a cross between Boards of Canada and um, I'd say it's across between Boards of Canada and cinem Cinematic Orchestra a little bit. There's some musicality in there. Maybe Plaid. Um, all of our Arnold sounds in there. It's, there's a real mix. Um, but it's... Um, that's very interesting. It's a project that's really close to my heart because I love the music so much. And I'm, I'm actually doing it in collaboration with a visual artist um, from... Uh, we well, used to live in Berlin. He used to be the visual designer of Trezor. Tofai's name is. And um, he's going to be my partner in terms of the, the outlook and how everything's going to sound and feel. 
I'm really excited about these two other projects. But I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole yet, so that will come. Okay, so to answer your question, good. I'm not going down any particular direction only. I'm just going to expand everything that I'm doing a bit further, go to the next level. Okay, so we're looking forward to hear what 2022 will bring us. <laughs> you, yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Vince. It has been a pleasure. And we're looking forward to hear you play soon and to hear your music. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care.